All right, all right. What's good, everybody? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan with your Impact Wrestling review from last week, from last Thursday, November 10th. So what I talked about a couple weeks ago was that uh, to better give you a little more consistency with the podcast, um, if T TW is not available on weekends, I'm going to go ahead and review the show. The caveat I gave you guys was if it was my Air Force Reserve weekend, I was going to completely skip it because I'm going to be totally honest with you on those weekends. I don't watch impact. And I, I know as a reviewer and as a content creator and a, a podcaster and all that, that's not good for me to miss episodes, but that is a particular time in my month where I have very little free time. Cause it's like my Monday through um, Friday job reserve weekend, Monday through Friday job. And then um, it's just very difficult for me to actually make the time to watch it. So that's what happened last week, and that's why I wasn't uh, podcasting for you guys. Uh, and then we tried to—I tried to link up with TW a little bit before this happened. We couldn't quite make it work. I was out of town this past weekend. I know I go out of, out of town a lot, but uh, the old lady and I went up to Chicago for the weekend. So um, now it's Monday, and I'm uh, giving you your impact review. So hopefully, going forward, it's going to be on Saturdays. I also told you guys last time I was still working on a an intro, a separate intro when I'm uh, reviewing impact. So still working on that. So that'll come. It won't just be me, uh, talking with no music, no intro, no nothing working on that. So, uh, going to review impact here. going to talk about the overdrive card a little bit, and I'm going to talk about a couple things that I've got on my mind. So the first thing on my mind, I talked about just about the talked about this just about 30 seconds ago that I don't usually I don't typically watch on my reserve weekends. And I can't even get away with watching it at like at work. I can't put my phone off to the side because I don't have the reception on base to, to watch it. So that's why it's just very difficult. This was an exception that I did my best to make the time to watch the episode well after it had happened. And the reason I did was because I saw the viewership number come out where it was 50 some thousand viewers. Granted, it went up against Thursday night football. It went up against, uh, I think the deciding game of the world series, I believe was that night. I, I, I get all that. I think we tend to use football as an excuse, you know, maybe, maybe that's not a good thing because I'll, I'll watch football over impact, but I just think we tend to use what else is on TV as an excuse too much. I mean, there's people who's like, oh, well, it, it's, you know, they're they're playing the 500th episode of of how I met your mother or whatever. Th there's excuses all the time on, on Twitter. But this viewership was so bad that I was like, I've got to watch this episode. I got to see if there's something uh, that turned people off. You know, I, I let, I, I lean more towards Yes, the World Series NFL was on. I, I lean more towards that more than the episode itself. Let me let me put that out there. But I did watch the episode. And in comparison to this one that I'm about to talk about right now, I thought last week's episode was not good. And I thought this one was pr pretty solid. And the reason I say the last one wasn't good was because it just seemed very phoned in. They went back to really, really old habits with the editing, the show was super dark. All that color correction shit that I was hampering on for the longest time. And I was on Twitter showing, showing examples of how it's supposed to look and shit like that. They did all that shit on this episode or that on that episode, they went right back to bad habits, the real deep, deep blacks where the, you know, the referees walking around and he just looks like a, a set of white pinstripes walking around because he's completely blended into the background it was just really dark and uh the eddie edwards and pco stuff you guys already know me well enough to know that i didn't like that <laughs> like there, there was probably a portion of you watching this was like bq is not gonna like this let's let's be freaking real that isn't my my jam i appreciate them trying to do something different but you know how I feel once they start putting the freaking cheesy music in, I'm done. Because you've taken any kind of emotion out of the segment, you're just giving us cheesiness, you know? So 
other than that, I thought the episode was okay, but it was really hard for me to consume because it was so dark. This episode looked better. Thank God. Um, I think they were both in, in Vegas, but it just seemed like with the last one, they phoned it in. They're like, you know what? We got all this competition. Maybe no one's even going to watch this. Let's just, let's just put all our uh, presets in. You know, like when you're when you're loading a video into your editing software, you're like, you've got your presets. I think they're like, let's just put the old bullshit presets on. Um, it's not that important the episode. Let's let's export it, send it to the television. That that's really what I think happened because it looked like shit. This I was really worried that there was gonna continue to look like that. Uh this particular episode looked a lot better, thank God. A lot brighter. You could just see what was going on. So um, good on them for that, but they definitely fell back into some, some, some bad habits that I do think, um, you know, even though I, I do think football and baseball played into it, I also think looking like shit plays into it as well. So I think, I think it's a combination of things. The other thing on my mind is I've given a lot of thought to this because people have been asking my opinion on the Nick Aldis situation with NWA. They know that I was like a really big NWA fan when it first came out. I was such a big fan of it that I had people unsubscribe to me because I, I liked it so much in comparison to what Impact was doing at the time. Like, my bad. I just thought what they were doing was really, 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 really good. And they were focusing on a lot of the things that I wanted Impact to focus on, you know, especially with original content. On YouTube, that was that was like my real big thing with them: original content that didn't have to do with wrestling, and didn't have to do with the past and all that good shit. I've talked about it quite a bit over the past year or so. That NWA NW for me has become like unwatchable. Unwatchable. Now I still watch it most weeks. I shouldn't say most weeks. I probably watch an episode a month, and then I'll try to watch the pay per views. Uh, the roster is shit. When I say it's shit, there's there's some really good guys and some really good girls. But you know what what have I what have I been saying is that this big portion of the roster, even if it's people they're just bringing in, are guys no other company would hire. That's that's kind of my my issue with it. Now there's a lot of guys and girls that I really enjoy in that company. Let me be clear, but I think the show is bad right now. Um, Velvet Sky on commentary. I talked about that a lot too. Take everything bad I ever said about Josh Matthews on commentary and Don Callis and Madison Rain and all the people that D'Lo and Strike or all this shit. They are prime peak Jim Ross compared to Velvet Sky on commentary. So the show's the show is borderline unwatchable. Why am I saying all that? I listened to the Nick Aldis interview that he did with Sam Roberts. I hate Sam Roberts' interviews with passion just because he annoys me. But I checked that out anyway because I wanted to hear what Nick Aldis had to say. Nick Aldis wasn't someone I previously wanted to be involved in Impact. When they announced him for Slammiversary, I was pretty disappointed uh, for reason number one because he's not someone that's spoken glow glowingly about the company over the years. And number two, just the way that they did it. You know, like they were kind of teasing, hey, we we got these mystery partners and all of a sudden it's just a picture of Nick Aldis over We Own the Night. I mean, it was just so lackluster in how they did it. So I wasn't excited. Um, I didn't like the possibility of him coming over, over to Impact full time at any any point, even though I've li I liked what he did in the NWA, like he was the face of the company. I really enjoyed what he did. But I'm listening to an interview with San Roberts and I was like, man, this dude thinks the exact same way freaking cat go go you go he thinks the exact same way about the company that i that i do the way that i feel the way that i feel it, it where it came from to where it went and you know the goofiness and the you know the, the silliness he felt the same way i did and and i connected with him on such a level listening to this interview i was like yo I'm all in on Nick Aldis now. He thinks a lot like I do. Just just his general thoughts, what he was saying about wrestling, even when he was tying in NXT shit and all that. I was like, 
I think I'm down with Nick Aldis. I met him once before. Pretty nice guy. Was, wasn't overly talkative, but pretty nice guy. And then I, I was listening to the Brace for Impact podcast, and they were talking about it like, yo, Impact needs him, Nick Aldis, you know? And then I started thinking about it. I was like, yo, they do need him. You know, like, we talk a lot about the main event scene over there. The reason they struggle with the main event scene, and I'm not even saying this is like their fault necessarily, because it's, there's a challenge in wrestling where when when someone's the guy, it's pretty easy to book him. But once he loses that belt, the real challenge becomes what do we do with him now to keep him relevant? All right. Great example is EC3. EC3 was a great champion. They took the title off him and they had a pretty good feud with Matt Hardy going. But after that, it fell apart and they didn't know what to do with him to where people would care. They completely lost it with him. You saw that happen with Rich Swan. They did how do we keep Rich Swan relevant after dropping the belt? They couldn't. I even think with Moose to an extent it happened. Now everything Moose does is brilliant. So it's not as bad, but I do think that happened with Moose as well. And I'm trying to think what other what other champions. Um, I mean, Omega was the champion for so long and Christian, so it's kind of hard to go back much further than that. But this is a problem Impact has had, and and a lot of the times, someone drops a title. You and you guys have heard me say they're probably out of here because what are they going to do with them? What do they have left to do? Like. When Ty Valkyrie was the knockouts champion forever. Then she dropped the title and it was like, the hell do we do with her? And she was out the door. Um, I, Deanna Perrazzo has been the exception. They found a way to really, really keep her relevant. But for the most part, it's a struggle for any wrestling company, I think. How, how do we keep that person relevant? So Nick Aldis fell, fell to that as well a little bit. Um, once he was no longer NWA champion, I don't know if they handled him the right way. I mean, they kicked him off the pay-per-view, but he had like a mid-card match, you know, that he was probably going to do the job. But all that being said, um, he knows how to draw a house. He knows how to talk. He knows how to be the man. He knows how to, uh, for you, for you to hit your wagon to him. He knows how to pull the wagon, you know? So I do think that this version of Nick Aldis that's grown a lot over the years since Magnus, you know, and they brought him back a little bit during the, to drop the global, uh, global force wrestling title. And that was a complete mess. I think he's come a long way. And I think he'd be a real asset to the company now, especially in that I, you know, listening to interview, getting inside his mind a little bit. I'm like, yo, he would be really good for impact. So I do hope that's, um, that's where he ends up, but who knows there's, they're still spending that, um, Good Brothers money. I think Bully Ray got a good portion of it. Um, I don't know what they're giving to Justin Gabriel. I, I imagine he's just doing a couple dates, but um, you know, Cardona is back in these dudes. I, I don't know if they're already f- spending it, but I, I really hope that they've um, they got some money aside for a dude like this. Bring him in, pay him. Um, let's talk impact. Let's let's, let's talk the uh, the episode that just happened, which I said was quite a bit better than the previous one. And it looked a lot better. This was not a, I mean, this was in a ten out of ten episode for me by any stretch of the imagination, but it was it was okay. Um, lots of we on the night, but besides that, pretty easy to consume. So uh, it opened digital media champion uh, digital media championship as Brian Myers versus Joe Hendry. Um, now th- I'm reading this off the Impact Wrestling website. It says here. Digital media champion Brian Myers versus Joe Hendry with Matt Cardona. So Matt Cardona is in the quarter of Joe Hendry, according to the Impact Wrestling website, the official ImpactWrestling.com. All right. People get mad when I say this. Don't hire amateurs. And you get crap like that. Anyway, uh, this match for what it was was fairly solid. I like both these guys a great deal. I like Brian Myers. I love Joe Hendry. I think everything he's doing right now is really, really good. I wasn't expecting a, t- a five-star Matt Classic here, but it was two guys that I that I like, you know, that I enjoy watching, that entertain me, 
two guys that I genuinely find funny. Uh, Joe Hendry won the match. He is the digital media champion. This belt means jack shit. It means nothing. Uh, the finish was fairly cold. You know, who cares? No one cares. But there's optimism at the same time because it's Joe Hendry. Joe Hendry is very creative. You know, we thought Cardona could do something creative with the digital media championship, but then he dro- dropped it. Uh, what was doing? What was Rich Swan doing with that thing? I mean, seriously, Brian Myers did some okay stuff with it, but we're we're ready for someone to really do something with this, and it's going to take a very creative individual who commits to it. You know, so if there was ever a perfect guy to hold this this belt, this nothing belt, it's Joe Hendry. It's still going to mean nothing at the end of the day, but he might make it worth paying attention to. I think that's the difference. It's never going to mean anything, but it can be worth paying attention to, especially with him holding the title. And they have no direction for the title. Everything that they said it was going to be, that's not what happened. There's no Twitter, exclusive Twitter matches. There's no exclusive uh, YouTube matches defending this title. You know, it's all... It's all shit that sounded good at one point. They have not followed through with it, so people don't care. But he can make it entertaining, I think. So, th- so this should be interesting. Um, but the match was what it was. It was, it was, it was an okay match. Um, some shenanigans with Heath and Rhino and all this shit. They kind of did this throughout the card and, and different matches. It, it's the AEW thing where they just can't have two people wrestle. Uh, it, it just people running down and getting involved. And it, it seemed like that for every match we had on here. That's what, that's what it felt like. So Heath Rhino, all the, all, all that nonsense after this was probably the best part of, my, of the show. In my opinion, uh, with Jay Vidal, which I guess he's like the social media manager for Giselle Shaw, this little video package that they put together, <laughs> Got a genuine freaking chuckle out of me. I genuinely cracked up watching this. I thought it was really, really funny. It's my humor. It's my kind of humor, that kind of shit. So I, I, I thought it, I, I found it really funny. And I'm always saying funny people being funny is, is good in wrestling. It's when people who aren't funny try to be funny that it's just like turn this shit off. And it's the same dude who does all the impact video packages. When I was watching last week's episode, they did back-to-back video packages, I think, for like Overdrive and for something else. I don't remember what it was. And they looked good, but at the same time, they were both edited the exact same way. The same guy was talking. It was the same cadence. And I'm just like, this is the kind of shit that makes every episode feel exactly like the last one. When There's just not that variance. Neither here nor there, because nobody even remembers that. Uh, but but what they did here with Giselle Shaw, where you know they're they're splicing in wrestlers talking about, you know, I'm guessing they were clips from like Impact Hall of Fame indu- inductions and 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 things of that nature, and you know they would cue in Giselle Shaw like props for this. I found it really really funny. I thought her handing out the photos was funny. I think it would have, you know. Give her some eight by tens a handout, not some Xerox copies. Like that looks really freaking cheap. But besides that, I, th- I think Giselle Shaw is doing some excellent things right now. I think she's going to be good in the ring. She's going to be funny. I think adding the social media manager dude is a really good, uh, you know, just good little addition, little, little lackey. You can probably take a bump here or there if he needs to. So big things happening for. Giselle Shaw. I wasn't a big fan of her getting, you know, challenging for the title this episode. It they look like they were trying to build something. If you if you go back over the last like two or three weeks, it looked like they were planting the seeds for some kind of build with Giselle and Jordan Grace. And that's not what we got. We just got the match. You know, so you guys know how I feel about that. People just get matches around here. Um and maybe that's just the wrestling landscape now. AEW does it. You know, just here's a match. There's no, let me get some momentum first. Let me win a series of matches. Let me win more matches than I've lost. Not 
that's all completely out the window. They just create the match they want to create for the title, you know. But the video package was really funny. Um, it was just as funny the second time watching it. You know, I, I went back and checked it out. After this, this episode had a lot of freaking video packages, a lot. They, they're just filling in the cracks now with these <laughs> video packages. But um, there was a Violent by Design one with Big Con and Alan Angels. And what I talked about on a last pod, and I've, I've said it many times before, Alan Angels, I'm a huge, huge fan of his. I'm a very big fan of this dude. I was a very big Dark Order fan in AEW. Not the current comedy version of the group, but... Um, the heel version of the group when they were at full force. I was a huge fan of theirs. Um, I've got just about every shirt you can imagine for the dark order. And um, I, what I don't like is that he's going by, it looks like he's just going by angels and big cons going by con. I hate singular names. They did it with Dina where he's just Dina. Give people full names. I mean, my God, but I'm, I think I'm looking forward to this more than most people. Like, when I hear people talking about the violent by design stuff, I hear more negativity negativity than I was really expecting. Like I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. It was for me, it was a super stale group. The stable, the stable was just stale as all hell for me. <coughs> Excuse me. This gave it a little more flavor. So I, I I'm looking forward to see what they do with this. I I really truly am. Um I thought him wrestling Sammy when they announced, announced a match with Sammy Callahan, I was like, already. And then this happened. I'm like, okay, cool. Now we can, we can build something. We can build this match, you know? And then they just announced the fucking rematch for next week. Or I, I don't think it's overdrive. I think it's the next week's episode. It's, it's someone's balls on a pole match. I, it's some, some freaking stipulation. I, I don't remember what it is but i'm just like man i just want to see some shit get built sometimes it, it's 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 wild because the thing is you know the feud's not over you're making a gimmick match whatever the result is it's not over you, you really think eric young and sammy callahan are going to wrestle this one match i don't even count the last one you think they're going to wrestle this one match and it's just going to be over why why do this just why why can't we just these are these are two dudes you don't have to have on in the ring to build a story there's some people you do like just i'm randomly saying this bupinder gujar like you can't build a storyline outside of the ring with that dude he has to be like being the ring wrestling and creating the story that way one way or one way or another like sammy and and uh Eric Young and and Violent by Design and I don't, you know, you, they don't have to be in the ring to build something exciting between these two, you know. So we'll see. Um, Trey Miguel took on Mike Bailey, X Division uh, title tournament. So I'll admit I was wrong. I said this whole tournament was put together for Mike Bailey to get the title back, you know, um, and I was wrong. I was wrong. I was very wrong on that. I'm glad I was wrong on that because I hate when shit is predictable. To me, it was super predictable. They went a different direction. Awesome. Uh, I still have an issue with the brackets and how they were set up. Like one side was very heavy. The other was kind of jobby, 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 job, job. But then now you see, okay, well, Kenny King had to take the loss and Trey had to move on. You, you see why they set it up. But it's just, just a really phony tournament bracket. Um, I was really expecting to see something because this match here, I said, yo, this should be the finals of this match. I was expecting to see something really, really classic. And we didn't get that. It was just another match where someone came down and, um, changed the course of the match. I love Kenny King. I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about this feud here with Mike Bailey. When, Kenny King cost him the match. Mike Bailey's acting was so bad. He just has a lot of work to go from a character standpoint, but I think working with Kenny King is going to help get him there. I, I truly do. This other stuff they were doing where he's just going out and having good matches and all that shit. Um, I think working with Kenny King is going to be huge for this dude. Uh, cause he's got a lot of, he doesn't, he doesn't have the acting chops. He's got the wrestling, 
the acting chops and the promos and shit is he does not have. So this is the guy I think to um, pair him up with right now. And man, hopefully they just build something special, man. I, I'm just, I, I just wouldn't be shocked if they just, this didn't get thrown on the uh, overdrive card, but we'll see. Um, so the, so Trey Miguel wins by disqualification. He's going to move on to face the winner, black Taurus and PJ black. I'm fairly certain PJ Black is going to win the, win that. Um, Black Torrey's got a little bit of momentum going, but this is impact. Like PJ Black's probably going to move on. But okay, match. I was expecting a lot, lot better. Um, but you know, shenanigans. So another another match with shenanigans. The backstage stuff with Jessica and Kaya and Rosemary. This is another thing I've been saying all the time. Heel Ro- Rosemary's f- face paint was badass. First of all, comedy Rosemary doesn't work for me. Um, comedy Jessica does. I like Jessica, but they, you know, she lost the match, and now they're taking it. They're, they're making her depressed and and gloom and taking the comedy out of her. So now it doesn't quite work for me as far as my entertainment level. I think this stuff would work better if if you remember like the early days of decay, they hung out in like legitimate dark areas of the arena. And it it was just, if how can I explain this? If there was a dark area in the arena that fit Rosemary's character, and then Jessica and Ty came into that, it would be better than the comedy setting that Rosemary has to step into and, and, in inverse the inverse of that so she it's like she has to taya knows how to do comedy pretty well but it's like rosemary has to adjust to the comedy and i just don't think that that works but um many of you may not care because we love rosemary we all do you know but i'm i keep seeing rosemary and i'm like are they ever going to put the belt back on her again they don't even pretend like she's going to be knockouts champion again. And I, I just think these kind of segments hurt her a little bit. If they're ever going to get her back to that point where she's, she's the girl, she's got the belt. You know what I mean? Uh, but I don't want to sound too negative on it because I'm, I am into the Jessica stuff. I think the, the theme song is great. I think the death doll, death dolls entrance is great. You know, I'm, I'm into them. I'm just not, I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, Rosemary doing any, any kind of comedy of sorts. But we'll see where this goes. You know, I, I'm down. Uh, then another uh, video package, which was Kenny King, I thought was excellent. I, I, I really like him. I think I'm higher on him than most people are. And then we get another match. It's Bo Pinder, Gujar versus G Sharp. I don't know what the hell. This was just a squash match. Um. You know, credit to them for trying to find stuff for Bupinder to do. I was, I was, you know, under the belief that he really should have just been a heel. They should have just paired him with Raj, paired him with Shira, and just went with it. But I think they wanted the challenge of, okay, we're not going to make another Indian dude a heel. You know, we got this country that's really into these guys. We need to give them someone they can cheer for instead of making them heels. I, I get it. But man, what what are they going to do with him? What what is the point? But I give them, I give them credit because at least you know they're kind of feeding him some of these jobber matches from time to time to you know so he can have a little bit of momentum. That's what I was saying like with Giselle Shaw. Like Giselle Shaw, when's the last time she won a match? I think she pinned someone in a tag team match. But it's like, why not build a little fucking momentum for some of these people? You know, so this helps them. I don't know if they know what they're doing with him, but, but at least they're finding a way to, okay, let's keep him on TV, kind of keep him relevant. Let's have him looking good. Um, I think he's got a shit finisher. Um, but besides that, people like him, you know, um, I, I really think he needs a mouthpiece. I don't understand why he doesn't have one. Um, you know, but, but he's a talented guy that, you know, I think sky's the limit if they can figure out what to do with him. Cause I don't think they know, right now uh there was rhino and heath talking backstage they're walking and josh alexander the world champion 
who should have his own locker room in kayfabe is just sitting on a chair in a dark corner um and then we're just back to the don't trust bully ray thing i'm I want to see what happens with this Bully Ray stuff. I'm interested enough. I thought they did a good job this episode of letting it breathe where Bully Ray wasn't all over the episode. Um, Josh wasn't all over the episode. It's just very minor. And it lets it breathe a little bit. So I, I think that's good. But I do want to see what they're doing. I'm very curious. I'll be very disappointed if it's just a cookie cutter like, well, Bully Ray actually is going to be heel. And, you know, I, I just hope it's something creative uh but rhino and heath were st here strictly to just tell josh they didn't you know don't trust bully ray they have no idea what they're doing with these guys as champions as well another backstage segment was uh some community theater of alicia edwards walking up to eddie edwards and they're talking and they act like in wrestling that these married couples um you know friends people dating stable mates and again, married couples, that they don't speak between episodes. They have dragged out this whole thing with Alicia and Eddie that for months he's been on her no more. It's like they only talk when they're doing TV. I don't know why they didn't find something with Alicia for her to do this entire time. They just insert her when she needs to be the wife. And that's that's it. That's That's why she's employed to be Eddie's wife on screen. In real life, too. But you know what I mean. Um, I, I again, I thought the Eddie PCO stuff was was bad. I thought it was over, also. And then, you know, at the end of this episode, he rises from the dead or something. They're gonna keep it going. They're gonna keep this feud. I don't care about going. I just I want to know what's next for Ed, Eddie Edwards. Like, what's legitimately next? Not. Fucking with PCO, but like, what's next? What are they going to do? Are they going to keep him a heel? They're going to start trying to get him to be a sympathetic figure again. I want to know. I would have liked to see him just him and Kenny King remain a thing. Like the two of them as not a stable, not a tag team, but an affiliation. I would, I would have liked to see that, but we'll see. Um, but th this was just bad acting. They talked about it on BTI also. Um, not BTI, but um, Brace for Impact, BFI. I'm sorry. They talk about this on a podcast, like skits. You know, like the the, the skits work in wrestling, where they just so happen to have cameras on them and they're talking and it's acting. It just seems like they could do more, um, more in the ring. I, I don't mean wrestling, but I just mean out there in front of everybody, or with Gia Miller backstage or something. I I don't. You know, it's whatever. It's really not that big of a deal at the end of the day. It just wasn't particularly good. Um, Chelsea Green with Deanna Perazzo takes on Mickey James. So this is the last time we'll ever see El Chelsea Green in Impact. I love Chelsea Green. I love Vexed. That's another division that's like cursed. You hold the belts, you're probably done. One of them's done or they're leaving or something after that. Because just with the lack of teams it's like once you're a champion what the hell do they do with you after that so i hope um i hope diana sticks around i hope she's not the next one out the door but but i've said this for how i don't even know how i mean forever chelsea green will go back to wwe tomorrow she'll go back yesterday you know um so i'm fairly certain that's what's going on with her this was a pretty good match between two girls that I like a lot. That being said, for such a great wrestler, Mickey James with the Bulldog, the DDT, the Thez Press, these moves look like shit. Everything else of hers is great. There's everything in the in the presentation of Mickey James and her promos, her matches as a whole that are just incredible. There's those three moves that look like dog shit when she does them and she just keeps doing them. And that's how she wins. The thing was with her DDT, it's always such a cold finish. That's the problem. It's the move takes forever to do. It looks like crap seven times out of 10. You know, every once in a while, someone Chelsea took it pretty good for the most part. It looks so bad. Um, 
And then by the time she crawls over to them, it's almost like you expect them to kick out. It takes so long. And then Chelsea Green's got her finisher, which is, is going to hurt somebody one day. I, I, I'm sure of it. All that shit aside, though, this was a good match between two girls that I really like, that I really enjoy. Uh, I love Chelsea Green, so I'm just I'm, I'm disappointed we're not going to see her see her um, any further. So, but this was another match. Uh, shenanigans at the end. It just seemed like every match just had someone come and get involved. Someone get kicked out. Someone brawl. Someone, you know, change the uh, decision of the match. the The finish of this was was not good. The uh, the match was good. The finish with the drop kick and the jackknife cover, it, it just did not look good. It did not look particularly convincing. But um, I still enjoyed the match, though. I'm always going to point out the shit I don't like. So if you don't like that, I am so sorry, folks. Um, but I, but I did I did like it. Um, the last rodeo continues. Yes. So Steve Mac, <laughs> so he's backstage looking for uh, Scott Demore. There wasn't a lot of Scott this episode, thank God. But there's Tommy Dreamer, and he was talking to Alicia Edwards backstage, and and this has been up for debate online. Johnny Impact popping out. You see that he steps out, starts talking to Alicia. She kind of pushes him back, like, "Hey, we're on camera." I had to watch this a couple times. The jury's still out on this thing. I don't know if it was meant to be a tease. I don't know if it was like done on purpose in any way or if it was an accident and they just decided, oh, we're not going to refilm this. Um, which, oh God, I hope that's not what it was. Or if they, they ran it and they're like, it happened by accident. Like, you know what? Let's get people talking. That's highly possible as well. Um, you know, I talked about the that Good Brothers money. Um, is it going to Johnny Impact? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. They'll probably bring him in to be another contender for the world title. You know, who knows? But um, <clears throat> Steve Macklin is the only person in this company that goes and asks for title matches. Everyone else just asks Josh, and then he gives them the title match. Like he is having a really, really hard time getting a, a world championship opportunity. Um, I, I feel that I could walk into Impact tomorrow and get a title shot, you know. So it's um <laughs> it's funny the story that he's you know struggling so much. Uh Zicky Dice had a match with Bully Ray. I don't even recall seeing this, to be totally honest with you. Um obviously it happened very, very quickly, but I I really don't even remember that it happened. But I know it ended up with Bully going through a table and challenging Moose to a tables match. Uh, what do we got after that? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Death Machine. You know, I said earlier, balls on a pole match. It's Death Machine's double Jeopardy match. What the fuck is that? It's probably a hardcore match. I'm sure there's something different to it. And then it shows Chelsea, um, you know, walking out into the cold with just her wrestling shorts and a jacket. But Deanna uh, tracks her down. So, Where are you going? She says, I'm going home. I don't know if it was a play on Mickey James when she had left that one time after she lost to Chelsea or if that she thinks WWE is her home because impacts more of her home if we're being, being real, being for real, for real. But I'm, I'm going to miss Chelsea Green um, quite a bit. Then they run down the um, the overdrive card and everything. Just lots of lots of we own the night. Um, after this segment, it shows, you know, Matt Raywall with his hand, you know, hand, his head, excuse me, buried in his hand. So frustrated, like, oh, you know, because Chelsea's leaving and Deanna's eh, this and this over we own the fucking night. That, sh that song is going to be the death of me. It is. Um, let's see what else. What else we got? Uh, it's showing a lot of old Frankie Kazarian stuff, uh, Bully Ray stuff, lot, lots of TNA stuff. World title match it was uh, Jordan Grace versus Giselle Shaw. Uh, this was really good. Giselle Shaw 
is really good. What they did with her with the video and the and the and the photos, you know, everything I was saying, they got something with her, but you can't just oh well, here's your title match. Everything she was like building up to, or she's taking a photo with the belt and all that, you know, it, it just happened so fast. And then and now she's out of the picture, you know. But this was an excellent freaking match. Um, Jordan Grace right now is delivering with everything she does. She can't have a bad match. It's impossible. It's not in her DNA. She cannot have a bad match. Uh, Giselle Shaw really doesn't have bad matches. I think I think she's incredible too. She's excellent. And this was something that I would have loved to see on a pay per view. You know me with builds. I love a build, and it, they just don't happen right now in wrestling like they should. But but um, excellent match. Grace wins with the Grace Driver. I still think it should be called Fall from Grace, um, but it's not. It's the Grace Driver. More shenanigans. So after the match, um, Masha Slamovich comes and lays her out. And I thought, okay, you know what? They did a good thing with keeping Masha off TV for a bit. You know, make her go away for a little bit because she had had this impressive win streak and then she loses a bound for glory. You can't just have her show up the next night, you know? So I think that's a good thing. But it happens and I'm like, okay, cool. We're going to get ourselves another little feud with these two you know they, they had one of the most incredible knockouts title matches i've ever seen so i'm i'm all for them fighting i'm all for them going at it again but i was okay they're gonna build a little something no 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 at overdrive it is a last knockouts standing match how the hell do you book this do you make masha lose again or do you have Jordan Grace drop the title where clearly you're trying to get Jordan Grace versus Mickey James at one point? Maybe they're going to put the title on, on Masha and uh, have Mickey challenge her instead of Jordan Grace. Maybe she still wrestles Jordan Grace, but I think many of us thought Masha would win at Bound for Glory and Mickey was going to build up to fighting her. Maybe that is a direction to go in. I can't do it. I can't imagine Masha loses again. I just, I just can't. But really excellent knockouts title match. Great way um, to end the show. I didn't think, you know, the, the attack after with Masha, I mean, it was every single match. Was there a, the only match that didn't have nonsense attached to it was the Bupinder Gujar match with G Sharp? That was it. That was the only wrestling match on this show that just was a wrestling match for what it was. Everything else was a sneak attack after something like that. And then they show this nonsense of PCO, who I was hoping we were never going to see again. A lot of you guys like PCO. I don't. All right. Uh, going to run down real quick the overdrive card. Um, Josh Alexander taking on Frankie Kazarian. The more and more I've thought about this, because what was pissing me off was I was like, why is Josh having so many feuds at once? Clearly, Josh is going to win the, you know, he's supposed to wrestle Bully Ray. You know, Frankie Kazarian is not going to win. The more I think about it, I'm like, you know what? Maybe Frankie Kazarian does win. Maybe the turn that Bully Ray does is helping Frankie Kazarian win. Or maybe some... I mean, you see the way this episode was booked. So it's highly likely that there's going to be some overbooking in this match. Maybe Frankie wins. Maybe they're trying to do a three-way at Hard to Kill. Maybe that's why they're doing this. Because other than that, why are they doing it? Why did they cash in, you know, option C... And the and the gauntlet are, are they are, are these two things tied together in one way or another? Like, is Frankie Gazarian sticking around as champion, or is he just going to do this overdrive match and then disappear again? I'm starting to lean towards Frankie possibly winning this thing. Heath and Rhino taking on the major players. Nobody cares. Again, another feud that they could have built and they chose not to. Here's my thing about these impact specials. They go really fucking hard 
putting these cards together. They go way too hard, in my opinion. You don't have to defend every title with these shows. Josh does not have to defend the world championship every single month. Why not one episode have the knockouts championship, the main event, or you know, or have two titles on the line, or make the knockout the uh, the, the knockouts tag one month, the X division title, the tag titles, maybe even the digital media championship. But you don't have to defend every single fucking title with every single one of these things. That's just my personal opinion i think with a roster size of this you know of this size that's not that not the biggest roster in the world i just don't think you can just keep putting the title on the line so much that's why i get mad about lack of building these things because i'm like yo they they need build they you you can't just have these people get the match right away because then the match happens who the hell are they going to fight next who the hell is the death dolls going to fight after they're done with this shit Speaking of Death Dolls, they're defending their belts. Of course they are. Against Tasha Steeles and Savannah Evans. Another another match that would have been great for the pay-per-view. I just get this feeling the pay-per-view is going to be a we're bringing in outsiders to challenge for the belts. And then the X Division Championship Tournament Finals. Trey Miguel versus either Black Taurus or PJ Black. I'm fairly certain it's PJ Black. Because that's what they think is going to get people to buy. And then tables match Bully Ray versus Moose. Hardcore rules, old school, balls on a pole. It's all the same shit. I, I can't say I'm really looking forward to the card. This is not a, not one I'm looking forward to. But I could very well be proven wrong. These things, These shows are usually really good. So I can be proven wrong. But right now, just looking at what I see here, I don't have a reason to care about any of these matches other than Josh and Frankie. You know, they got a little get a little story going, but I have no reason to care for these other matches. You know, Savannah Evans beat Jessica in a match, and all of a sudden they're fucking number one contender, you know. But no, I, I mean, I'm still interested to see how this card comes out they have so few matches announced which is really weird it's only five or six five one two three four five maybe they're doing like tw always says and like have a banger just four or five match card you know the the old nxt model is that what they're gonna do i would give them all the props in the effing world if they did that if they are, which hey, this monthly special, it's it's a uh, it's an hour. It's not three hours. Like three hours is way too long for these. It's like hey, it's an hour show or two hour show, whatever. We're gonna give you five banger matches instead of what they do, where they get everyone as, on there as quick as possible. They have a bunch of thirty day feuds or two week feuds that culminate at these things. So I, I want them to prove me wrong with this one. I want them to like pleasantly uh, surprise me and just put on like a, a, a great show. I'm looking at the card. I don't have a lot of interest in it, but I'm, I'm open to them proving me wrong. Absolutely. Uh, so that's going to do it for, for me. I know um, I don't have that same energy as TW. I know it's a completely different dynamic when I'm uh, reviewing the show by myself. But hopefully we're going to get some content with TQ, sorry, TQ, TW going soon. TQ is an R&B singer who I like quite a bit. So that's why I got him confused. But for the Impact Lounge, I'm your boy BQ. I am out. Talk to you next time. Peace.